interesting things, not only about numbers and certain shapes and certain volumes, but there were really interesting things about certain people. And we just started paying attention, and by we, I mostly mean me. Uh, I've been running all of these teams, fine art, public art, commerce, fashion, education, coding, modeling, film, book production, the internet, and in film, of course, is photography. I'm the one who's done all of the photography for the books, and it was quite a hill to get up because traditional photography techniques did not work for what we were doing. We weren't able to see every single unit. And when we're modeling by the unit, this isn't really the scale that you can see our sort of micro level work. But when we're modeling and making state changes by the unit like this in our models, it's very important that we can see the structure. And so each of these pieces here, these are 56 different pieces from the project. And they model a variety, not only of forms, but of states, and of theories about color, theories about everything. And we've got our favorite ratios and equations and numbers and patterns and spirals built into these forms. And it's been extremely interesting to see how if we work, say, from a you know, not too spiral, everybody's favorite, or we work from a rigorous spiral, spiral, or we work from a circle or a square start, how we go differently with basically the same genetic commands for our pieces. We discovered, much to our thrill and horror, that the thread paths that Dustin and I developed, the MRA band is exactly the structure and performs almost the same function as our DNA. And the sort of half strand that we use, the elegant diagram, well, we use it for cloning. So we, you know, we've had a bunch of realizations that were a little off-putting, a little thrilling. And when we discovered that three was no different from one, was no different from five, if you're talking about things like outside shapes, outside edges of shapes, these shapes right here, just the simple shapes of the triangle and the square and the circle. For the work that we're doing, particularly the cloning, there's almost no difference between those shapes. An outside edge, on any of those shapes has a certain number of units. The only reason that they're representing as triangles, circles, squares, is because we've given them some sort of coding information that indicates a directional or state change. We can give them any information, and if it can be accommodated in the practical geometry of pieces, it'll work. And so, all of these pieces probably it's almost embarrassing to tell you how long these took to make. We're afraid to estimate too correctly, but it's at least 6,000 hours of human time. And well, we thought when we came up with that number that if we had known that we had 6,000 hours of CPU time to give to the world, you know, would we sit down and make the 56 bracelets? Uh, that's what we did. And uh, surprisingly, we came to some really elemental ideas. So this is just an overview of the forms that we started with. Our work has become, in some way, much simpler. In another way, not so much. It's Columbus Day, and so I'm my own AV guy, too. And I never did find the remote, so I'm just going to run this from my, from my back. This is another set of shapes that we began experimenting with. I discovered that we could use much more open forms to make more close shapes. I was on my way to trying to defeat what I saw as something very inefficient in the field, the long, wiggly starts. We need to gather our units together in a form. Why not start in the form that we know that we want? I could not comprehend why a long, wiggly rope of beads this big was needed to make a precise and a precisely fitting piece of work that was supposed to fit my wrist. And forms like this are more predictable because they progress unit by unit, and not bead by bead, but element by element. And so you can simply keep adding elements until you're done. Other things, like zigzag shapes. Frequently, the zigzag shapes are laid out as straight lines, but really they're making this kind of a piece. So that'll catch you up on the forms on the poster. Dustin and 
and I were interested in circles when we first started working. And I had come from a background of metal smithing. And so I was well accustomed to forging my own custom connections. You know, if I needed a setup like that, I just went in the other room and made it. It was no trouble. So we had a good library of structural information. We understood jointed connections. We understood movement. And we wanted to bring that into the future. <coughs> These are some of the pieces that I was making in metal. I learned traditional metal smithing. I also have ceramics experience, and I was tremendously interested in the centering work that was being done with metal clay. Finding particles of fine silver, centered together in a kiln, you get solid metal. The people who were making it weren't doing the metal smithing jobs that were needed to actually make it useful. They were just sort of baking it and then leaving out all the parts like work hardening and all of the conditioning that we do to metal to make it wearable. I worked and worked in that field, became frustrated at the lack of ability to pass on innovation and eventually just left a textbook on the table on the left and started doing this. But all these explorations were really fun and I learned a lot about an unexpected type of structure and all of this sort of particle by particle work fed right into the own beat work. And when Dustin and I decided to do the book, I mean, this was the day at Beat and Button, you probably recognize it. And we were so excited because we thought, oh, we've got some genuinely new ideas. This is the forum that I just held up. We saw a piece by an English beater named Jean Power. And I thought this piece really modeled a lot of natural forms. If you look up at the very tip top, you can see the place where the triangular tube, which is actually really round, is meant to join the other piece. And so you can see how the sizing goes. You can see the structure. It's very beautiful. These pieces fold like little accordions. And I was tremendously engaged in the concept, but I couldn't understand what people were saying about the triangle. I was actually not understanding this word corner because I kept wanting to take one of those kind of puffs, open it outward, and look at it from the inside. And when I did that, what I saw was a straight strip of beadwork with two caverns, two inside-out horns. And I realized that there was no difference between a, a horner and a horn, or a little mountain that topologically, you know, topologically grows from the surface of the beadwork. And I also noticed that there wasn't actually any difference in the finished structure between the increases, which are like a crane or a ladder bill, <coughs> and the rest of the material just follows it up effortlessly, and from the decreases, which were hunted and gathered together from long <coughs> strings of work, or, you know, different for different forms. But I sensed an inefficiency between two forms that I thought were essentially the same. And I've been struggling since somebody first tried to teach me to make a triangle to devise a system where the other half of our mountains could be formed with ladder builds as well. And I'm happy to say that we did it. We actually solved all of our problems that we brought to the table this week. I know there are more. We began noticing strange things about shapes and numbers. And like I said, certain numbers, certain shapes were more perpetuous than others, they simply had more potential. And it became clear that not only did the shape, but the shape order turn out to be a serious matter. We needed to understand how to communicate our somewhat radical ideas and try to get the most ancient field that I know to accept new ideas. Humans have been beating for 80 to 100,000 years. That's a lot of habit. And the stitches that we were using, square stitch, AOE stitch, you know, you could describe the entire methodology in one little paragraph in the back of the magazine. This is how it works. This is how it goes up and down. People had a few tricks, but we weren't asking ourselves the basic questions about what are we doing. It was like we all knew that four plus four equaled eight, but we had never asked ourselves what eight really was and how eight was different if it was ordered in groups of two, if it was in the form of a square. 
it all became extremely interesting. And strangely, the simpler the shapes got, the more complicated the ideas, as suddenly everything seemed relevant. So we had a lot of winnowing to do. These are just two more examples of the form. We began experimenting with making horned and winged forms, like that cup up there, and doing layers and different kinds of projections and leaping into space and seeing them from out there the most efficient way to get back down. Sometimes it turned out to be to gather the material. Other times it turned out to be that if we wanted to bring our form in, we needed to add material. If we added a mountain, for example, on the surface, it was enough tension and draw from the rest of the fabric that it was very much like making a dart that you couldn't iron flat. That little mountain stole from the circumference or the area of the space. And so we learned that by adding peaks, sometimes we were smallerizing our interiors, which was useful for tailoring. Unexpected, useful. We started experimenting with the very simplest forms we could find. And I started developing with Justin the DNA star. And you can see the form in there. It's expressing as crosses. But it's actually more of a ladder. Uh, you can look at it in any elemental way you want. But basically what we did is that windowed area that you can see in the middle form, that goes together, boom, 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 unit by unit. And with it, it carries a trap on each side. And that one little stitched together round of beads stands in for three to four rounds of the previous stylus dart. And it holds shape from the beginning because we're coding all of the information for the form that we want into that strand, that band, that living spine of the piece. I discovered that it could hold up to 12 layers of ease because there was jointed you know, movement built in. It could hold at almost any angle. Immediately I had a building mechanism that was basically as strong as an ivy in my building, but it was flexible, incredibly flexible. We could build curves and peaks and valleys, and they'd stay after just one round of start. Big deal. From there, we began developing, again, just the forms in nature. You know, we really wanted to study the ratios. Uh, we wanted to understand how nature grew these forms. And we were really motivated by people like Gaudi, who planned the weight load on the arches in his cathedral, the Sabrina Familia, by hanging chains upside down, hanging weights from the chains, making judgment calls about balance, and then flipping those very interesting shapes over to be the catenary arches that hold up the building. And what the chains could support evenly turned out to be the weight that the roof would support evenly. And Gaudi then was able to intuit calculations that were far beyond, far beyond anything that could have been done at the time. And he was just dead on, dead right. And the reason that he was so sure about his calculations wasn't because he was a mathematician. He had studied the tree outside his window. And if you go look at the little explanation of the Gaudi work in Barcelona, there's a little quote from him, and he said, they asked him which architecture books he had in his studio. He said he didn't have any, but he had this tree. And all of his forms came from the tree. So we took that to heart and began studying, even at the molecular level, the cosmic level, what was really going on. And we just kept finding all the same numbers. We kept coming down to 12s and 6s and 3s, which were the same as 1s. And it became clear that we actually didn't need anything special to start all of our forms. And I developed casting model after casting model, and even in the last week, we had major breakthroughs with all of us together. And then we sort of found out that all we needed was just one little edge with receptors, one little stick with teeth, to start absolutely anything in our project. So that was actually very interesting. We had assumed that these things were more difficult to build than they were. And by making them more difficult, by being efficient, we had actually lost a lot of brain power that might otherwise have been allowed to work with us. Generally, innovative, busy people are not willing to waste days and 
days of their lives making long, wiggly, incorrect starts. They're busy. They're doing things. Uh, we started making more and more intricate layered structures with horns. This was a popular pattern. And you also notice, as you look at the names on these pieces, these people are from all over the world. We're connected only via the internet, and our project is entirely open source. That's how we're actually getting all of this contribution from all of these people. Again, more and more intricate, more and more studies of the difference between flat and round, the differences between eight and seven, the differences between low peaks and high peaks. We studied them all as best we could. We studied connected layers and how that affected fits. We discovered that we could do reversible shapes that basically had two completely different fits and model two different structures depending on how they were arranged, and that was fun. And the beauty of all these things is that they're human ornaments. And I've noticed one thing about human beings. Well, two things, actually. There are two things that human beings do that I don't think anything else does. And I'm not a fan of human exceptionalism. I think it's unwise. But I have never found evidence of any other species putting things with holes on strings and ornamenting their bodies. And this strikes me as a material since we've been doing it forever. Humans have to be. I mean, it's just what we do. It's who we are. It must be, in fact, coded in there somewhere because we can't not do it. If you put little babies down on the beach, human babies, they, they would eventually find the things with holes and things that are like strings and they'd have them around their neck and they develop a creation mythology. I can't be sure that animals don't do that too, so I don't include it as a third thing. But I'm suspicious. I think it's probably only us. In fact, <coughs> I was realizing as I filled out these boards, most, if not all, of these things are strictly human concerns. None of them strike me anymore as essentially real or meaningful. They're just interesting. And the only thing that I find that I'm interested in is the solving. And so every time we have another question, another puzzle, that's what I want to do. Uh, and all of this, this is great information, but this isn't why I'm in it. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful database for community. We've done a lot of fashion photography as well, and we've walked fashion shows. Oh, that's too big a picture. We've walked fashion shows at the Fashion Institute of Technology. We've got all sorts of interesting things coming up. So fashion is never wrong. Um, we're continuing to explore these crazed, smooth and worn forms. Crazy math in there. This is a piece by Nancy Jenner, who's here in our class. And the pattern work and some of this stuff is incredible. And if you had a chance before you go to look at the pieces on the table, I find that you can also actually read people's heritage, their avocation. This is a piece by a Norwegian musician, Ingrid, she's in our class, and it reads like music, and it reads like Norwegian folklore. And I can show you example after example of aeronautical engineers who build pieces that look like flight. And it's just been fun to see who does what. This is a piece by Sam Norgard, here in our class as well. And Sam is on our fine art and public art team. Sam's a professor at the Savannah College of Art and Design, and we'll be taking our work to that school as well. And she's actually just gone and done it, and she has brought the beadwork to her art students. Sam teaches at Savannah in Foundation, which means she's getting every single kid that comes through that school. And you know, some of them, well, huh, they're all amazing. But these people, as Sam told us yesterday when she was showing slides, they've only been beading for three weeks. They get it right away, they're kids, and they are making the most extraordinary things. Anything with a hole can be called a bee. This is actually part of a giant vertical piece that hangs down from a main zone at Savannah, and there are several of these long sort of feather boa-like shapes. It's one of the most beautiful installations I think I've ever seen. Um, again, three weeks of experience doing beadwork. These art students are expressing themselves not only beautifully but intelligently because they're starting right. They're, they're starting with Sam. And they're not wasting time. 
on inefficient motion. Oh, again, three weeks of experience. Amazing, right? Go, Sam, go. <laughs> this is a piece, this is a set of pieces by Catherine Pasta in our class as well. And this isn't the best view of them, but one of the things I want to point out to you is if you have an opportunity while you're here to feel Catherine's work, which is on the table, you can feel that her attention is as soft as silk. And uh, it really changes the geometry of the pieces. This is another one of her innovative works. And Kim Van Network, who is on just about every team on this book and is running our commerce team, is also a fully trained metalsmith. And Kim has combined big work with metal. This is an exploration in flying. This is an exploration in captivity. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? This piece is with her, in fact, maybe even on her, if you'd like to see it today. It's larger than you might think and exquisitely made. One of the things that has become extremely useful in our thinking is this concept that we've just come up with of exploding sets. We've started doing these projects, again, in terms of teaching beginners. I was thinking, what's really easy to make? And we have to be taught to make a simple purely triangle or a warped square, little shapes like this. You just need to count to three or four. You put the beads in a circle. You make you know, predictable ads around the side, and before you know it, you have some fascinating form that you then can use our exploding round technique to cast other forms off of, or you can build a big piece all at once and explode it into a handful of sections. I thought this was gonna be one of the most powerful ideas we had until we had the other <laughs> ones I'll tell you about next. But in terms of beginners, you know, I, I think that we left a lot of people by the wayside intellectually, and that's only because they didn't have the patience to follow what are admittedly counterintuitive and some of which were time-wasting steps in the traditional long starts that humanity has perked on beading for the last however many thousand years. We just got precision bead work, precision beads from Japan in uh, the 1980s. You know? So we've actually really only been able to do work of the quality that you see on the poster here, this tight, tight work for the last 30 years. But I am surprised that we aren't seeing more of this. We're happy to bring it to the table, but I'm, I'm engaged and I'm confused about some of the ideas we've had because they seem very basic. Mostly you find yourself wondering why we didn't do this before. Uh, for example, it's very difficult to teach a beginner to make open starts because you've actually got to build the thing from scratch. Very, you have to count, you have to get right, it can be confusing to explain. This, in this circumstance, we're just actually making a square and adding to it. And the person who's making it that has the benefit of being able to add section after section, try on, if they're making jewelry, try on the pieces that come off, find one that fits, and simply use that as a casting model. Remember, it doesn't matter at all if it's square, round, or triangular. You can always cast anything you want to off of these edges. And so we've just been seeing what people want to make. Some people gravitate to the triangle, some to the square. We've developed these exploding sets for a variety of shapes, triangles, squares, pentagons. We sort of stopped there because we suddenly realized again, the previous realization, there isn't really any difference. And there are things that we can do with pentagons to instantly come out with triangles and two wings. And turned out that was more than we needed. But we kept working because it was interesting. This was a pattern for an exploded triangle. And these pieces are so fun to teach people. We were at a bead store in the South End showing our work, um, teaching the owner. Imagine our surprise when at that bead store in the South End, you know, we see one of our classical shapes there in paper flower by the register. Imagine our even more surprise when out here in the hall in the status and we see that the sea sail robotics lab has set up a display of basically robots on pencils with paper flowers on top. And I said to the robot overlord, we have all those forms in glittering glass if you, you know, like to play with ours. And they're interested, which is fantastic. And so we're going to collaborate with those guys. Unfortunately, none of them are here today. It's a day off. But that's going to be fun. And we're suddenly seeing these shapes everywhere. It's tremendous. Thinking about nature, you know, I, 
I just couldn't get away from the fact that it only seemed to be us doing these ornamental things. I, I started looking really diligently into the animal kingdom, and, and there's a bird who sticks a little feather in her tail, possibly because it looks better, I don't know. But the bower bird is one creature that absolutely, unequivocally, is making art. And this bird, this is just sort of a close-up of the structure of the nest. Kind of interesting. These birds are the only animals that I know that are actually sort of encouraged to innovate structure. Their nests are all a little bit different. You know, this is the, if you're a blue jay or a cardinal and you want to make a different sort of a nest, that is just, it's no go. But these birds, they're, I mean, look at him, isn't he cute? He's collected all of the blue things and he's right now building a curated exhibit to attract the mate. And the birds with the best exhibits get the best mates. And when these guys are doing this, they're all sort of doing it at once, like art school finest. They're all making their exhibits. And then the ladies all come to see. And there's always going to be a weirdo. Maybe it's a minimalist. He's just got like one little brown nut. And to him, that represents all of creation. But everybody else walks by and says, it's just a nut. And he doesn't get a mate. So what he'll do is he'll actually redo his exhibit. And he'll keep repeating, attempting different kinds of art until he does or doesn't attract a mate. I think that's fascinating. But we haven't seen that bird put anything on its own body, which is kind of interesting. All right? So cute. Here's some minimalism. Look at that. I'd go for that guy. <laughs> on a lot of clutter. And this is interesting. This is the yard guy inside the house very neat. I suspect that we find that just like there are sports in every species, you know, intellectual, genetic sports, I'll bet one of these birds has crocheted a doily. We just don't know it. We weren't there. We just made a fuzz and sticks. We didn't see it. Or we thought, oh, some human messed with the bird nest. How could it? You know, monkeys, primates could easily feed. I think they just choose not to. You know, people have given monkeys feed some needles and thread, and they've just really chosen not to. So this is extremely interesting to me. We're dealing with an ancient field, really ancient, and we seem to be the only creatures dipping into this. And these structures seem to, in their own beautiful, mathematical, structural ways, represent all of the ratios and forms that we can come up with in creation. Well, we seem to be able to model most processes or structures without having to count higher than 12. Uh, these are strange things to say about ornamental beadwork, but in fact, we really noticed some interesting things. And so our intention is to explore them. And I'm going to go through category by category the things that we're doing and give people the opportunity to get involved. One of the reasons that we wanted this room wasn't we thought we could fill it up, but we wanted to take a film of this talk, which will summarize the entire experience, where we're at now, what we need next, and what we've got on deck, so that everyone in the world who's interested can see it and can get involved. We have over 20,000 active participants from over 35 countries. I have no idea how many workers. These are active participants. It's all online. Most of it's done through social media. It's completely open source. I mean, the ideas I had yesterday, I've already communicated to the suite of you today. There's not a lag, not a minute's lag between discovery and sharing. Been fantastic. This is one of the shapes, one of the forms, and one of the concepts, this zigzaggy shape, that would have the most success rebooting. It's a fantastic shape, and we find it all over. Sometimes it's going to be an even zigzag, even if the Masonian knits, and some of the patterns in nature are extremely even. Zigzag chevrons. Sometimes you see very uneven peaks of up and downs and present a graph of data or you know the all-wing bangles we make can grow in an unlimited fashion. 
unless we give them terminating coding, like saying changing an increase to a decrease, or starting with a decrease. But these forms were challenging to build from the start because these are the ideas that really had captivated me. All of the up peaks were done on a ladder build with a herringbone increase. We'd be going along, making a flat beaded fabric, and then we would insert an event into one of the spaces in the fabric. This event was a herringbone increase that would begin a wing. And I've got a close-up picture or two of this. One of the things that we noticed on the other side of the piece was that the mirror peaks on the bottom were not ladder or spine built. Instead, the material was laid out. Let's see if I can find it through the chalk here. The material for the decreases were actually, it was laid out horizontally. And the event, the, de the decrease, was in the middle. And so rather than actually building the sort of spine build that ended up like this, with the fabric of the peyote just following it right up. Every time we wanted to pull together two beads of the two-lane highway we were intending to build here, we had to run over and get this one, and run over and get this one, and bring them over here. It was like starting an ice cream shop to sell Neapolitan sundaes, but the shop that carried your vanilla was all the way over here. And then the strawberry was all the way over here, and the chocolate was the bread. And you, every time you had to do this, well, maybe the guy with the other ice cream shop had figured out how to do this right away. Well, he did. Um, this struck me. I mean, this guy has to go all the way up here, pulling all of this together. Was the reason that a start for something that would end up to be this size and ideally should fit you well and not fall off or be impossible to get into, we were helpless because the starts for the pieces were this big. And it became difficult to accurately predict what would happen next because of all of the variation just in human technique. Your tension, the fiber that you're using, the beads you're using, even the finish on your beads could change your fit by as much as the size. And so, what I decided to do was to use the all-wing form in which our events that we included were all increases to make a form that just went up and down like this and use it as a casting model, as a cloning device. And so we started making these beautiful wearable casting models where this gorgeous all-wing bangle on my wrist would then turn out to be something that we could sketch onto, just basically sketch onto with a new round of beads to make the right track form. And after the lecture, we're going to do demonstrations of that if anybody would like to see it. The structure of the ladder bill is pretty interesting. It's a great close-up picture of it. As you see the wing building, all of these beads on each side are just climbing in a very natural fashion that ladder bill that reaches from the lower left all the way up to the top. And the way these pieces go together is a sort of one bead increases on the side and two bead increases at the top. These events that we insert, whether they're zero beads for a decrease, two beads for an increase, these are just information for a state change that might be just a moment in time. Maybe we're going flat and nice. we need to raise up a vertical wall so that we can once again move out in another direction. Maybe we want to make a little set of petticoats. We don't know what we want to do. We need to have strategies for state changes. Increases are one of them, and they turn out to be the cleverest way to make decreases. It was very interesting. I'm going to leave this back up here, and then I'd like to briefly go through the categories that we've got on here. You can see what we're doing, what's available, what's coming next. The projects that we have in process, some of these have been really fun. One of the things that I really wanted to do was I wanted to develop a notation system for the beadwork so that we could actually lay into the rounds of beads the information either on what we were thinking, what we were feeling, 
how many beads we used, what the delicate color numbers are. Some things are more useful to know than others, right? We wanted to be able to communicate numbers first, but we didn't really have a way to make zero. There's no null space in the beadwork where we can say this means nothing. And so we had to devise a code that would both show zero and be able to be read without a key by space aliens. Anything that could figure out base 10 should be able to understand or say. And we did it. And it would, you know, it's one of the things we can show you. We did it. It was fantastic. It's very simple and we love it. And we're going to publish it on the book blog next week. We've got two new books in progress, which means that we have 400 pages of opportunity. All of these books and all of these projects are filled with work from people all over the world. And we'd like to include you. So play with our ideas, send us photographs. And these two new books are some of the easiest things on this board to get involved with. Museum exhibits. We are putting together the most fun stuff. We're going to go big. We're going to go tiny. We're going to go to every museum we can get to. And we're going to show what we can do. We're going to show how it sparkles and glitters. We're going to do high fashion. We're going to do film. And we're going to do theater. It's going to be fun. Public art. Sam Norgard and I have been thinking independently of what we can do in terms of showing these shapes big, casting giant pieces of glass, or creating beadwork sculptures by the side of the lake, floating them down the Venetian canals like Chivuli did, with dissolving suture in them so that as they float down the river, they split cleanly into a suite of smaller pieces, all of them wearable. You know, stuff like that. That's the kind of thing that I've been wanting to do. So we're on it. Gallery shows. We've already got them underway. Uh, our project has now achieved a living, breathing quorum of nerds. If there's anything more beautiful than that, I don't know what it is. What it means is that anything we can think of, anything we can dream of, is achievable. We, we now have done the work. We've done new work in an ancient field, and it's good work. And there's no reason that we can't discuss this with the media lab, we can't work with CSAIL, we can't take this to RISD or Savannah or SAIC. We can't take an exhibit to the Tate or get a grant to make a big public art project. We've done the work. It's good work. Our forms are very beautiful. They speak for us on their own. And so all of these things are already happening. And anything you can think of, if we're interested, it can happen too. Fashion shows. This is big, beautiful work. We're continuing to make it bigger and beautiful than ever. We're making giant pieces. We're making a bandolier that'll hold a lot of these flower forms that might even be robotic. We're making a beating heart in honor of Salvador Dali. We're making, oh, you name it, giant flowers that open and close. This is going to be fun. We're working with conductive thread, interior lighting. I'm, in, I'm going to New York for three weeks after this, and I'm going to work with the costume designer from the Blue Man Group who's using conductive thread to sew into the body suits that the dancers are wearing. And so they're actually a projection screen. Data is coming into the thread suits. We can do that. Why not? So I'll be doing that while I'm there in New York, meeting with those people. Animation. I really wanted to take one of our closed triangle pops, cut one of the corners. Corners. I was even having trouble understanding Corners. I just wanted to see what was inside. Cuss puff, open it up, looking in at the horns. That's an animation that we're going to do. Things like that to open and explode and unwind and unwrap our forms so that people could understand what's really going on. And so professional animations. We're working with the guy who did the animations for the New Horizons mission to Pluto. Why not? We know him. He's the best in the world. We're working with Carter Emmert at the Museum of Natural History, who does the visualizations on the big dome. Carter says we can put on a show there. Why not? We know him. He's the best in the world. So stuff like that. More, more, more modeling. I want to model everything. Unfortunately, I don't know everything. So we have to work with everybody. I'd like to work with molecular biologists. I'd like to work with everybody at MIT. 
Uh, robotics, as I said, we're really interested in what CCL's doing, the conductive thread, the lighted sculptures. As a writer, I'm super interested in the messages that we can leave in the work. Our notation is one thing, right? We can leave numerical notation. But what if we can also communicate? I was always very taken with the Sagan and Druid gold record you know, that went on, I think it was on Voyager, beautiful gold record that was sort of a record of our civilization. We suddenly realized that we could start writing in code. You know, pick your favorite code, whatever it is. I think we can think of something interesting to do. We want to write braille poems for the blind. You know, we want to see if we convert our numbers and our ratios and our calculations from base 10 to base 8. What's going to happen? I don't have enough experience to know. What about other mathematical systems? What about, here's something that everybody younger than us is learning. Do any of us know it? Common core math. I don't even really know how to do it. And yet, it's possibly a cancellation bending and notation code might allow us to more effectively communicate. As an innovator, I can't just say, oh, I'm old and I don't want to learn it. I'm going to go learn it because maybe there's something there. There has to be. Um, I want to go to schools and reach out to the kids. I want to teach the kids what we're doing early on so that they then can look at the world around them and maybe not make so many assumptions about structure. Instead, be asking, what's eight? What's four? You know, what's a triangle? Um, we're going to continue the series of free lectures. This is just one in a long string of, of lectures. And the beauty of these lectures is that it doesn't matter why we're doing it or who's in the audience or what city we're in. We're recording them all to the best of our ability. We're going to do the job that we can to get the information out. Materials grants, we're not asking for them. We're giving them. We've done a good job over here on the commerce team. We've got two books out, we've got three more coming out, all on the layout table right now. The pattern book, which can be the chapter one that hasn't been written yet on some rework. We didn't even know we were missing it. Now I know. We're going to write that pattern book, and it's going to have all of these elemental ideas in it. The exploding sets, the pop-off brick racks with no exploding rounds, all of it. The sizing, the, the cloning to size, even from the stick. We'll find a way to show it also. It's engaging, it's doable. And then when those beaters understand what we're doing there, they're going to come with us into the other books, the Explorer's Guide. And we're going to have more and more and more people. It's happening already. 20,000 participants, it's growing every day. So I think that by what we're doing, actually going back to a more remedial level, will benefit, it has benefited us as well. The simpler our forms get, the more we understand about how simple everything is. And the more we understand, the better we can communicate. Mentoring, this is already happening. Many of us are mentoring younger beaters. Those of us who are on faculty are teaching younger beaters. We're gonna keep this up. I'd like to see more and more and more of this go on as we get more and more professional people involved. And the things that we like to model, I mean, this is all just very obvious, the fields that we're crossing over. Our architecture, these are just little building units. Mathematics, physics, geometry, we can build, we can model any building. Color and light theory, fantastic. I'm really engaged in this. Numbers theory, uh, my friend Jack, as I said, was telling us, hey, if three isn't any different than one, all of a sudden, I think people are becoming numbers theorists. And I said, we'll take it. <laughs> And they looked up, studied a bit about what he was talking about. You know what? I think he's right. I think we're becoming number theorists. Sculpture, what a great way to make little maquettes, right? We've done it. Painting, what's more painterly than our patterns and our colorways? We want to explore all the ratios we can get our hands on. Pixels, this is the same modeling I do when I'm working digitally. It's just the same. Cloning, I want to learn way more about what I can do with art. Because clearly, this is what we're working from. We can do anything. And language. We have actually developed a whole new language because we needed to describe the new forms and the new techniques and the new processes we were doing. 
And so we've actually had to invent words just to talk about, just to build a structure library. Never mind the processes. We need, we immediately started building a structure library with type and language. Wings, horns, zig bands, fortune teller bangles, all those things were very helpful. And we need the language to describe the new techniques for state changes or direction changes that other people weren't making. So we're still working on this language, and it's very important to those of us on the writing team. How we communicate, how persuasively we communicate, will directly relate to how many people we have come into our project. Words for new thread paths. You know, when we discovered these two new thread paths, uh, we wanted to name them right away, right away. The Emron band, the Zig band, the elegant guy band, the exploding round. We've named every, sing every single new thing we've done. And then this one's solved, the notation, so that's the language we've done. Over here, all these teams that I mentioned before, these are all spaces that are available. If there are any of you that wish to work with the project, more interested, I'd very much like to work here. We're looking for an intellectual home for our work for a sabbatical period. So I'm actually looking for a spot somewhere here at MIT that we can park ourselves at and get the things done that we can't do ourselves. I mean, I would like to develop a dissolving suture that we can use for magic tricks. I'd like to work with the media lab to see what we can do. You know, I'd like to learn more about how our ratios and our numbers translate if we move to other mathematical systems. I have a sneaky feeling that they're not going to be very different since we're modeling Terran forms. I suspect that yeah, what works on Terra might surprise me. It'll be fun to find out. Um, so th that's the basic overview of what we're doing. It's been tremendously successful. The open source format for our work has been a dream come true. I never suspected when we started doing this that we would reach so many people. So I would like, for those of you who are interested, we're going to split up into a series of sections with a bunch of different work. And I would like to have the opportunity, for those of you who would like to study our forms, to go through this form by form, technique by technique, and explain to you at whatever level you're interested in what we're doing. And so I'm gonna call a 10 minute break right now while we set up our stations. And those of you who wish to noodle around with us, stick around and stay. Uh, those of you who want to catch up with us online, we'll be posting a link to everything that we're going to continue to do down here in this room on the book blog. So you'll be able to see the whole thing no matter what you do. Uh, if you'd like to have another one of our posters, don't forget to take one with you. And we do actually have some of our first two books here, if you'd be engaged in those as well. I have a longer written version of this talk that I'll also be posting that goes into a little more depth talking about the processes that we're still studying, the relation to, I think, other human disciplines, the work that we've done in other fields. So uh, that'll be available as well. One thing that would be tremendously useful to us, too, is if any of you, we've actually been writing on the blackboards all over the status center, and we've got one here, too. If any of you would like to take a go at ordering these shapes, um, I'd like to show you how I order them, just so you can see how crazy this is. Uh, everyone's doing it differently. I just looked up a spiral today online, and I was shocked. Let me tell you, shocked to hear that the definition of a spiral was a shape that starts from the inside. How is that more a spiral than this? It wasn't Wikipedia either. Uh, interesting, something to follow up. Kim and I were talking about this. Everybody I know makes their spirals from the inside out. Kim's the one on our team who makes them from the outside in. Does anybody else here make their spirals from the outside in? I think it's very unusual. So the definition sort of, I don't know, threw me for a loop, seemed a bit restrictive. So these five shapes, the triangle, the square, the circle, the cross, and the spiral, we'd love to know what you think about these. For me, as someone who's interested in practical geometry, 
I'm most interested in make, how can I make these forms, I'll always start with the cross. To me, this is the building block of life. This is found with the smallest forms. This is in our beautiful coating sticks. And from the cross, you know, I can measure that out. I can get it right. And from the cross, I can make the square. I can make the circle. I can make, by dividing, not just one, but many different kinds of triangles. I can make a variety of spirals, precise or imprecise, using these tools, using the cross and the square. I can start dividing rectangles to get to a Fibonacci spiral if I want. For me, starting with the cross is everything. Other people, Kim Van Antwerp, immediately came up here and went in and put the other shapes right in here. They weren't that different to her. And the cross was important, not just as the first shape, but because it was both connecting all the other elements and, you know, keeping them together. If I had to order them in terms of importance, I would order them more like this. Over here I say no difference, surrounded by the basic forms of life. Everybody has a different answer and it reflects something deep about the way that you think. And so, as I say, the blackboards are everywhere. We're running around writing them down. Uh, if you want to take an or uh, a stab at ordering these five shapes before you leave, it would be fantastic. And so that's another thing that we're doing, studying what's easiest for people. When we set up uh, in a little bit to show you these shapes in our work, show you how to make them, when we sit down with beginners to teach them the exploding set, it's just absolutely the case that usually people have a strong preference between the triangle and the square. Most people have a strong preference between counting to three or counting to four or counting to five. And you know how we all take little shortcuts. We count by fives or we count by twos. I really like to stick down at three. We had a fascinating experiment when Robin Douglas, a great beater on our team, came with a very large five-sided bangle that had a clasp on it that was built open. And I held this bangle up in its five-sided form in class. And I just asked everybody to get a feel of that. How does that feel looking at this pentagonal shape? I myself was not relaxed with it in its five form. And then I slipped the two sides together, and it was a nice square. And I said, who just relaxed? And a couple people, in fact, were vastly relieved when it stopped being a five and it went to four. And then I put it down into a triangle form, and it still fit me, and I relaxed. And, I, I, and others did too. I just really feel that once we find our form, we can stick with it, we can explore it. Once we're teaching people to learn to be, we should give them choice of starts so that everyone will have a well, stronger chance of success. We've seen this work and we've seen it work well. So an interesting thing about this was that when Dustin and I, six years ago, right, we sat down to write the first book, it was like, a, it was like George and Jerry sitting down to write Seinfeld because he just threw those five shapes on a piece of paper and he said, that's our book. I said, that's our book? That's our book. And it took us years and years to find all those shapes in our work. I mean, the one we found last was the cross, my favorite one of all, but in fact, they were all there. And uh, that's, been, that's been fantastic to slowly over time identify what Dustin didn't even know he was talking about when he drew those shapes on the board. So that's the background. That's what we're doing. We're going to set up some shapes and show those of you who'd like to learn how to make them, how to make them. Thanks for coming.